Hello, I'm Professor Richard Wilding from Cranfield School of Management. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the blood supply chain. And I'm really pleased to be with uh, two people here who are very much involved in this. Sue Cotton, and Sue is the National Blood Stocks Management Scheme Manager, and she's responsible for managing the blood supply chain at the National Blood Service. And also, Joanna Dobbin, who is working for Cranfield, but she's working on a project with the National Blood Service and the National Blood Stocks Management Scheme, actually looking at demand drivers within that environment. So, Sue, what, what, can you just describe briefly the blood supply chain for us? Well, the blood supply chain is quite complex. It starts with a donor, a volunteer donor who gives a unit of red cells, about a pint of, of blood, at a, at a donor session and that blood is then taken away to a processing centre where it's tested and processed into different components. After the testing's been completed and the unit's been labelled as and it's passed all the testing etc, it then goes out to a hospital and the hospital, a blood bank within the hospital, then makes that blood available for a patient and it is eventually transfused to a patient. So we take that unit of blood, which is actually, is in it 470 millilitres of blood, and then that is broken into different components. So what are those different sort of components that we get, Joanna? You put it through a centrifuge and it separates into red blood cells, a buffy coat and plasma. And then those three products um, are then processed further. Red blood cells are the part of blood that carries oxygen um, around your body, um, so extremely important. And red blood cells, they have a shelf life of 35 days. The buffy coat is part between the red cells and the plasma, and it has uh, a component called platelets in it. Um, platelets can also actually uh, be extracted through apheresis, where um, you put the whole blood back into the patient and you just take platelets. And platelets um, are essential for clotting. They contain agents that help make your blood clot. And then the final part is the plasma as well, isn't it? The plasma has a lot of clotting agents in it. Right. So um, it's, it's used along with platelets uh, to help make blood clot. And uh, it's, it's mainly used for a massive haemorrhage. So, Sue, so we've got different shelf lives in these, in these products. So the red blood cells... 35, 35 days, as we just days, said. Yeah. So what are we looking at for platelets? Platelets, then? it's a very short shelf life, so it's only a shelf life of five days. Okay. So it's always a challenge for the blood services to be able to collect enough platelets um, for the hospitals and the patients they supply. And then plasma, what does that run out to? Plasma, it, it's um, like it says on the the bag really it's a frozen component so a bit like frozen peas you can keep that for a long t a, a long lot time. longer time so up to two years it can be kept frozen and then it's just thawed for use as and when it's required so, so from a supply chain perspective it's quite interesting because what we've got is we've got some very short shelf life products that's, five days that's right um, medium shelf life product 35 days and then long shelf life product which is effectively two years. Yeah, right, so, okay. so a, a large range of, of shelf lives with a f relatively few products. And that puts different pressures on the on the supply chain, doesn't it? it does. Because you need, um, on those short shelf life ones, you've got to be able to move it through to who needs it quite quickly. And wastage can be an issue, which is something we've been looking at, isn't it, Joanna? There's different wastage codes for different products for red blood mm. cells. Uh, you have time expiry wastage and you have a out of temperature control so that's when the cold chain's broken you also have fridge failure and some other miscellaneous wastage mm -hmm. but for platelets uh, which as we said only have a five day shelf life over 95 percent of the wastage is time expiry and you have either time expiry within the blood service or um, time expiry within hospitals is when they are ordered uh, for surgical use or for medical use mm -hmm. by a uh, consultant and then not transfused and they're unable um, 
as the hospital hospitals can't return products to the blood service, then the hospital are unable to allocate the mm -hmm. product to another patient before it expires. Yeah, I think we need to emphasise that the amount of wastage is actually quite small if we're looking at these supply chains, but it's still significant because we want to try and get the most out of it, which is really where our project, uh, through this thing called the Knowledge Transfer Partnership, mm -hmm. um, ha has been sort of helping in looking at this particular area. I think finally we should finish on just some of the key challenges though within, um, within the blood service and I know that one of the key things has been collaboration uh, between all the various elements of the supply chain. So I mean why is collaboration so important within well, that environment? <clears throat> Collaboration is really important for demand planning so that the blood mm. service can plan for, for demand. But at, at the moment we have very little information from hospitals about what is their expected demand on a, either a quarterly or a yearly basis. So that is a, a real issue as far as planning for demand in the future goes. So really from, from that perspective what we're having to think about is, is we need to be able to get better information from hospitals that's right, um, yeah. But there's also requiring better information as well from, I guess, the supply side of the supply chain because, um, because you've got a separate entity which is then generating the donation. That's right. It's, it's all got to um, fit together, as you say, Richard. So we've got a volunteer mm. donor, so we need to ensure we're collecting enough blood from the volunteer donors at the right time. And also that's got to tie in with the demand from the hospitals as well. So it's, it's quite um, tricky, really, to manage so we've got these different supply chains, different products, different shelf lives, and it's really managing and understanding time. Um, you've been doing some work on this, haven't you, um, from a supply chain perspective of just doing some time-based mapping. What were some of the findings that came out from that? I did some value stream mapping and time-based process mapping, especially for uh, platelets, especially apheresis platelets, as mm. they need minimal uh, work done on them once they're processed. And, Really, I think what came out of it is if you think about the four areas, key areas of supply chain um, design, you've mm -hmm. got uh, IT infrastructures, process design, um, and people and organisations. Mm -hmm. I think what we find in some areas of the blood surface, like for instance, apheresis platelets, you have a different process, you've got a different product, but the infrastructure hasn't changed. So it's the same supply chains for the different prod uh, products as it were and this is creating some challenges uh -huh. in its own right. Yes. Okay well thank you both very much indeed and um, if you want further information on some of these things uh, do take a look at our website.